With centuries worth of history, there's been plenty of time for sitcoms to establish long-standing records within the genre. Although records were meant to be broken, some have stood the test of time. Let's take a look at the sitcom records that may stand forever. Appropriately for a country that aired the first sitcom on TV, Britain can also claim the longest-running sitcom in history. In January 1973, BBC One aired the first episode of Last of the Summer Wine, a Roy Clark sitcom about three older men who engage in a variety of youthful hijinks and adventures in the absence of spouses, jobs, or other responsibilities. The first season of the show wasn't very well received. Admit it! You're bored already! Nevertheless, Last of the Summer Wine, like its characters, got better with age, and eventually became an institution of British entertainment. As time went on, it seemed impossible to kill, surviving the deaths and departures of major cast members and the growing indifference of the BBC. It even continued during the changing tide of public opinion as the program entered its second, third, and fourth decades. But in 2010, Last of the Summer Wine finally went off the air setting the record officially at 37 years, 7 months, and 25 days. Despite this admittedly impressive accomplishment, it should be mentioned that Last of the Summer Wine doesn't entirely deserve its place on this list. Why? Well, because this record will almost certainly be broken, specifically by a certain decades-spanning primetime cartoon, which will leave Summer Wine with the consolation prize of being the longest-running live-action sitcom. The show that will likely unseat the last of the summer wine in terms of sheer longevity already holds numerous sitcom records. The Simpsons was officially launched in 1989, and it's been going ever since, becoming the longest-running American sitcom and the longest-running scripted primetime series of any kind. When it was renewed for its 33rd and 34th seasons in March 2021, The Simpsons ensured that its total episode count would be at least 757. If we're being honest, it will probably be a lot more, far and away the most episodes for any animated sitcom. That renewal also meant that The Simpsons will be on the air at least until the end of 2023, at which point it will be less than four years away from the sitcom longevity record held by Summer Wine. There's no end in sight for Bart, Lisa, Homer, and Marge. After its longtime network distributor, 21st Century Fox, was purchased by Disney in 2019, The Simpsons arrived on the Disney Plus streaming service. Here, it will presumably remain until it stops making a profit. Given the way Disney tends to treat its intellectual property, it's extremely unlikely the show will be cancelled prior to its 38th year. The Simpsons just keeps going, smashing record after record in the process. We are by no means done talking about The Simpsons, which, among other things, is famous for its guest stars. A hallmark of the show has been the way celebrities appear as themselves. It's a star-studded roster that includes, just to name a few, Leonard Nimoy, Rachel Maddow, Lady Gaga, and Hugh Hefner. There was a time in the show's heyday when you weren't really a celebrity if you hadn't been on The Simpsons. With that in mind, it's no surprise that The Simpsons hold the Guinness World Record for most guest stars in an animated series of any kind. According to Guinness, the total number was 810 as of April 2020 though obviously the number is even higher now. It would be utterly inconceivable to imagine another show, let alone another animated show, being as guest star friendly as The Simpsons. And as previously mentioned, The Simpsons is not going away anytime soon. Season 33 hasn't even arrived yet, and we already know that comedian Maurice LaMarche and NFL Red Zone host Scott Hansen will be added to the ranks. So it seems pretty safe to say that no TV program will likely ever have more guest stars than The Simpsons. As you might expect, a show with the lifespan and accolades of The Simpsons also has a history of cleaning up at the Emmy Awards, the highest honor an American television program can achieve. It won its first Emmy in 1990 for the episode Life on the Fast Lane and would go on to absolutely crush the awards for the rest of the decade, including stellar individual years like 1992 in which it tallied six wins for Outstanding VoiceOver Performance, and 1998, when it won Emmys in three separate categories. While it never saw that particular level of dominance again, The Simpsons continued to rack up Emmys throughout its existence, most recently in 2019, when it won for an episode addressing themes of homophobic bigotry called Mad About the Toy. It was the 11th Simpsons victory in the category Outstanding Animated Program. 
No other show has won in that category more than five times. Similarly, Hank Azaria and Dan Castellaneta have each won four Emmys for outstanding voiceover performance for their work on The Simpsons. At this level, they're tied for most ever, alongside Seth MacFarlane. All told, The Simpsons has set a Guinness World Record by amassing 34 total Emmy Awards, the fourth most of any show in history. No other animated series is even in the top 10. Given the unlikelihood of any other animated show becoming a cultural monolith like The Simpsons, it seems safe to say that this Simpsons record will also never be broken. Now that we're done celebrating The Simpsons, let's talk about some Emmy Award records set by non-animated shows. First up, 30 Rock. Tina Fey's lovingly irreverent business of television sitcom that aired on and made fun of NBC from 2006 to 2013. Despite consistently shaky ratings, 30 Rock was beloved for its lampooning of the backstage workings of Saturday Night Live and the NBC network in general. So it was appropriate when Faye's SNL parody of vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin in 2008 led to an increase in exposure and appreciation for 30 Rock. This culminated at the 2009 Emmy Awards, in which the show's third season set the Guinness World Record for most Emmy nominations for a comedy show in a single year. In addition to Outstanding Comedy Series, which it won for the third year in a row, Faye and Alec Baldwin were both nominated for acting, along with eight other performers in guest and supporting roles. Ironically, Faye would win an Emmy that year not for 30 Rock, but for her send-up of Palin with three more nominations for direction, four for writing, and four in the creative categories, 30 Rock's Season 3 garnered 22 Emmy nominations. It's a number that hasn't been surpassed by a comedy show in more than 10 years, and probably won't be at all. The record for most Emmy victories for a comedy in a single season is held by the most modern show on this list. No comedy has ever done what Schitt's Creek did in 2020. Coming off its final season, the Canadian sitcom won all seven of the major comedy awards – directing, writing, the four acting awards, and outstanding comedy series. This is something no comedy in history has accomplished. Dan Levy, who worked on Schitt's Creek in every capacity, became the first person in history to win an Emmy for acting, writing, directing, and producing in the same year. Throw in a couple of creative category wins, and Schitt's Creek took home nine Emmys a world record for a comedy in a single season. It did all of this while up against the finales of beloved sitcoms like Modern Family and The Good Place, not to mention the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which had previously held the record for most single-season wins. How did the Schitt's Creek sweep happen, especially considering it had never won a single Emmy in its five previous seasons? Some have speculated that voters, quarantined in their homes due to COVID-19, had spent their time binging Schitt's Creek on Netflix, leading to a sudden swell of support for the show. It was a unique situation that we're unlikely to ever see replicated. As we've seen, there are several sitcoms over the years that have had a positive relationship with the Emmy Awards. Still, the one with the most total Emmy wins hasn't even been mentioned yet. In 1993, Cheers, one of the most recognizable and popular sitcoms of all time, went off the air after 11 seasons and 28 Emmy Awards. But in an almost unprecedented turn of events, the Cheers spinoff was arguably even more successful. Guilty as charged. Frasier followed psychologist Frasier Crane, who had joined the cast of Cheers in season three. Frasier hosted a Seattle radio program and interacted with a delightfully eccentric group of family and friends. The show was a hit at the Emmys from the start. It won the award for Outstanding Comedy Series after its first season and would go on to win for seasons two through five making it the first series to win that award in five consecutive years. By the time Frasier was finished with its own 11-season run, it had racked up a total of 37 Emmys, which was, at the time, the record for a scripted series of any kind. It has since been eclipsed in that regard by Game of Thrones, but Frasier still holds the record for sitcoms. The Simpsons is the only show that has even a vaguely realistic shot at beating it. Nothing else has even come close, though Modern Family did manage to tie the five consecutive Outstanding Comedy Series wins accomplishment. Frasier was anchored by the performance of its leading man, Kelsey Grammer, who won a record-tying four Emmys for his portrayal of the title character. He was also nominated for playing Frasier Crane in both Cheers and Wings. For a time, he also commanded the highest salary in network television, at one point signing a deal with NBC worth $1.6 million per episode. 
That record, however, was almost immediately broken by Ray Romano for the show Everybody Loves Raymond, for which Romano got paid $1.8 million per episode by CBS. And a few years later, the same network gave even more to Charlie Sheen for his work on Two and a Half Men. While Sheen's contract is technically still the most lucrative per-episode deal in sitcom history, context has to be considered. He was only making that amount of money for the show's eighth season, and the last four episodes of that season were cancelled after Sheen's explosive falling out with CBS. Likewise, Romano's $1.8 million was only for one season, whereas Grammer's deal was for two. When you do the math, the $76 million Grammer received for the last two seasons of Frasier shakes out to a bit more than what Romano got paid during his most lucrative contract. However, it should be noted that Romano also earned royalties for the show. Regardless of how you define highest paid, no sitcom actor since Sheen has come anywhere close, and we'd be surprised if it ever happened again. Charlie Sheen wasn't the only performer CBS opened the bank vault for after the success of Two and a Half Men. The show, which was premised on two brothers, Charlie and Alan Harper, raising Alan's son Jake, also holds the distinction of employing the highest-paid child actor on television of all time. Angus T. Jones, who played Jake, reportedly made $250,000 per episode, a number that Guinness recognized in 2010 after an analysis of TV earnings by the New York Post. A 2014 article by the Post, however, claims that by the time Jones left the show, he was making considerably more. $350,000 per episode. By that time, Jones had started publicly disparaging Two and a Half Men for conflicting with his religious values. The show's tenth season would be his last as a regular cast member, with the role of the half being taken over by Amber Tamblin for the final two seasons. Jones did, however, make a cameo appearance in the series finale. So maybe his being the most financially secure child actor in TV history may have occasionally overcome his distaste at the sinful nature of Two and a Half Men. The earning numbers we've looked at so far are all well and good, but there's only one man who can reasonably claim to be the highest earning comedian of all time. It's been more than 23 years since the legendary sitcom Seinfeld wrapped up its iconic nine-year run. However, when Forbes released the 2020 edition of its annual list of the world's highest-paid celebrities, Jerry Seinfeld was once again the highest-ranked comedian. He raked in $51 million over the course of that year. That was enough for Guinness, at least for the time, as they update that record on a yearly basis. But it's also just difficult to imagine another comedian ever making more money over the course of their career than Jerry Seinfeld. I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm, I'm a funny person. Seinfeld has reportedly earned as much as $400 million per year from Seinfeld syndication royalties alone. He also recently signed a $500 million deal with Netflix for the rights to the show. Beyond that, though, is the sheer longevity of his comedy career, which he somehow managed to get paid to reinvent. The 2002 documentary Comedian follows Seinfeld around the comedy circuit in the years following the end of the show that made him famous. The doc hangs on the detail that Seinfeld has decided to completely overhaul his act and cut out every previous joke and routine he'd ever told. The choice paid off. Not only did Comedian make a couple million dollars, followed by his popular Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee series, but his ongoing relevance convinced Netflix to pay him $20 million for a new comedy special as recently as 2020. Just as it's difficult to imagine any comedian making more money than Jerry Seinfeld, it's also difficult to imagine any network making more money from a single episode of comedy television than NBC did on May 6, 2004. That was the day NBC aired the series finale of Friends, another sitcom that etched itself into the hearts and minds of a generation. The show's 10-season run kicked off in 1994, introducing the world to Jennifer Aniston, Lisa Kudrow, Courtney Cox, David Schwimmer, Matt LeBlanc, and Matthew Perry. Each of them were reportedly making a million dollars per episode by the end, due to the program's massive popularity. When it was time to bring Friends to its conclusion after a decade of success, it was clear to everyone that the final double-sized episode would be a must-see event for the entire country. As a result, NBC sold advertising spots on that episode at rates unheard of for anything short of the Super Bowl. Every 30 seconds worth of ad time during those 44 minutes of TV cost $2 million, which remains a Guinness World Record for any television series to this day. 
As we've seen elsewhere on this list, the fracturing of the television audience in the era of online media and streaming services makes it all but impossible that such a feat will ever be repeated. The sitcom format that most of us are familiar with involves episodes airing in 30-minute time slots. Traditionally, it was 22 minutes of sitcom interspersed with 8 minutes of commercials. Occasionally, a sitcom will run longer, taking up an hour's worth of airtime or operating under a different format due to an alternative revenue model from standard advertising. Still, you rarely ever see sitcoms that are shorter. But believe it or not, they do exist, and some sitcoms are only a minute long. In 1998, TV Land, a cable network dedicated to broadcasting classic television episodes and movies, introduced 60-second sitcoms. They were tiny, standalone mini shows that appeared in between TV Land's programming and its commercials. The network was brand new, having launched in 1996 and hadn't even sold ad space during its first year. Shows in TV Land's 60 second sitcoms lineup included The Gaveltons, which chronicled the adventures of an absurdly litigious nuclear family, and All's Well, where every episode ended with a police officer showing up to eat pie. TV Land is recognized by Guinness as having produced the shortest comedy show in history, and we dare somebody to try and break that record. Everybody loves Raymond, and that includes the greatest sitcom records today. Brad Garrett, who played Raymond's brother Robert in the show Everybody Loves Raymond, won three Emmy Awards for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. Beyond his acting abilities and his skill at poker, Garrett stands out for two reasons, his deep, distinctive voice and his towering height. Standing six foot eight inches tall, he would eventually be recognized by Guinness as history's tallest actor in a leading role. That's not just for sitcoms. According to Guinness, Garrett is the tallest leading man in any screen medium. He surpasses movie stars like James Cromwell at six foot seven, the tallest actor to ever receive an Oscar nomination, as well as both Tim Robbins and Dwayne The Rock Johnson at six foot five. Sorry, Apprentice Bride fans, although Andre the Giant was 6'11", he was hardly the lead. Same for Richard Keel, who was 7'2", but never a leading man. The fact of the matter is that people as tall as Garrett don't usually become leading men, on TV or in the movies. The average male lead in Hollywood stands at about 5'9", so he will probably be recognized as the record holder for a very, very long time. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.